everyone, welcome back. We missed you, kind of. But Lindsay did a phenomenal job last week, so just, just, well, we know you were watching, you were micromanaging, I know, I got text messages. Come, in, come into the light. You don't, don't leave the light. Oh, you're bringing a mic. I, I need to clarify, when I'm watching and texting, I'm, I'm doing it for the purpose of ribbing him, not for micromanaging. So when, I, when I'm watching and that camera's on and you're down here texting, as a joke and harassing you, since you do that so well to me, I say, quit texting, I can see you. <laughs> to which he uses it in his sermon that I'm micromanaging. I just want everyone to know that I don't micromanage from the live stream. Would anybody in the tech booth like to have a five minute rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> Bye. I said. <laughs> they all nodded their heads. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, so I walk in my office this morning, and on my desk, which wasn't there Friday, but on my desk is this thing right here, and it says A. M. Leonard's Gardener's Edge. To which I'm like, oh heck no! <laughs> like, who in the world puts a gardening book on my desk? And I looked at it in the back one seat. It actually is addressed to me. Somebody obviously doesn't know me. And I thought, well, let me just flip through it for a moment. Oh, look at that. Garden border fork. Yeah, I want one of those. The only fork I want is one you sit at the table with. Ground breaker border spade. No. Okay, I'm looking through this thing. Oh, look. There's a gardener's apron. The apron I want to wear is the one in the kitchen, okay? Like, I'm looking through the. Here's one. This thing here kind of rolls, looks like one of those bingo things. You kind of roll the bingo things in. It collects acorns or nuts. <laughs> Need one of those in here. Okay. <laughs> Jowdry, you'd like this book. I'm going to give this to you when I'm done, after I shred. And I'm looking through it going, there's not one thing in here. Oh, look, this one. This is a easier than a wheelbarrow, and it takes up less space. It's the garden glide. It looks like the pans. You ride in the snow and you pull it with a rope. Yeah, why would I want to use that instead of a wheel? <sighs> Going back to the Stone Ages. And they know we invented the wheel? So I'm looking through it going, yeah, there's not one thing in here that interests me. Like, you want to put something on my desk, put golf balls, golf clubs, something. Oh, it's this one. Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is it. Deer stopper. Stop pests once and for all. Scram for cats. Okay, we got scram for cats. We've got deer stopper. Stop pets once and for all. I wonder if this would work on Troy. <laughs> Here, Peter, this is yours. Obviously, they don't know who I am. I'm going to Weiss. I don't need any of that stuff to garden there. Well, how are you? I asked Troy to sing that song now because we're going to sing it at the end, I believe, but you never know. We could change directions, you know. God, that's never happened before here. But I was at the lighthouse yesterday morning, and our friend Larry Weaver spoke, and he spoke a message about the Great Escape, and he did some World War II stuff, Peter, that you would have loved about Dunkirk and all of that. And, um, but he talked about the rapture of the church, and he talked about those, the second, um, when Jesus comes back, not the second coming, when he comes back permanently, but when he comes back to meet us in the air, and just that, and it was just kind of jogging my, oh, my memory a little bit in terms of, I just thought, well, I think I'm going to preach a little bit tomorrow on what happens next. There's a bad theology of heaven in the church. You know, because a lot of people think we live on, we're going to, like, live on clouds, we're going to strum some harps. Could you imagine that? Me strumming a harp. We're going to kind of float around with some vapor thing or something. Well, you know, walking on the streets of gold up there. And How many know that's not where we're going to live eternity out? We're just not going to live eternity out that way. Um, it's kind of funny. In that song, I can only imagine, it talks about how we'll worship him forever. But how many know that worship him forever is not going to be a perpetual song, a perpetual Song service. 
I mean, no, it's going to be, worship is going to be incorporated in our work. It's going to be incorporated in re- responsibility we'll have on the new earth. And there's all of this is going to be wrapped up in the one ball of worship. And so I began to think about this, and I thought, what am I going to preach on this morning? So I'm simply calling it this, right? This, right here. But that place. Okay? But that place. How many know that we often use but in our life? It takes us from something bad to something good. How many of you know, it's been raining a lot lately. But that's actually good for us, isn't it? I mean, you know, but can often be followed by something good. Now, oftentimes we use it as something bad, right? But today we're going to use it, this is simply it, but that place. Let me take you. Revelation 21 says this. Then I saw, this is the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, has a vision of, uh, of the end time events. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. How many know that we're living on an earth that one day will not be anymore? Praise the Lord. Two over there, one over there. This is the right message for the day. All of you in the middle are going to get something, right? That, that, okay? We live, you and I live now. Whoa. Slow it down, son. We live under a current heaven and on a current earth with the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, okay? These are prophetic scriptures that point to the new heaven and the new earth. This one's in Isaiah. He said, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I created Jerusalem as rejoicing and her people a joy. Here's another one. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Here's the one out of um, Peter. Peter says this, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Listen to me. We, you and I, we, we live with this promise that one day there's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a new earth. Now, let me say this to you. When you hear new heaven, how many of you are wondering why we need a new heaven if we have a heaven? If it's heaven, why do we need a new? Because we're not talking about heaven where God is enthroned. All right, the the new heaven doesn't refer to the heaven where God is enthroned above. That's not what it's referring to. Let me show you three heavens that scripture talks about. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere, the blue sky, the heavenlies. How many know when you look out there today above all that gray rain, you see blue sky? Okay, that's one heaven. The second heaven is an outer space, the night sky, when you're looking in the galaxies. How many like to look at the stars? Hmm? Okay, the third is that place where God lives in glory. How many know that one's not becoming new? That one's not changing, right? When scripture speaks of a new heaven, they're meaning a new blue sky and a new nice sky, not a heaven where God dwells. So when you're seeing that, understand he's not talking about, oh, God decided to renovate heaven. You know, God moved in some new furniture. He moved down some furniture. He kind of put, he kind of put a new fridge in. No, no, we're not talking about all that, right? The new heaven and the new earth will be new, listen to me, in character, not just time. I mean, we live on an earth now that is contaminated by sin. That is contaminated by sin. It just is. The ground still produces thorns and thistles. It's contaminated. I mean, there's evil in this world. There's all this stuff, Right? The new heaven and the new earth will not just replace the old. They will be a better heaven and a better earth. It'll be better all the way around. Stick with me. So here we are. We're living. We're living in a place that has an atmosphere that has been contaminated by sin. How many know a man, God put man in a garden. That atmosphere was perfect. It was perfect for growth. It was perfect for men to live forever. It was perfect. What contaminated that atmosphere? Sin. I mean, sin always contaminates the atmosphere. 
How many of sin will contaminate the atmosphere of your house? How many of will contaminate the atmosphere of a church? Right? We live in a place that has been corrupted by the impact of sin. How many know all of creation groans? How many know that has been subjected to futility, not of its own? Right? How many of you have ever been subjected to futility, not of your own? It was your children. How many of your children have ever caused you to be frustrated? Some of you are being so kind. I'm just so glad my mother's not here. She'd be like, how many of you have ever had grandchildren frustrate you? Wow, Linda. Linda, did you guys ever know if you heard Linda over there? She's like, oh, but we're much more patient with the frustration of grandchildren, aren't we? How many of you ever had friends frustrate you? How many of you ever had pastors frustrate you? <laughs> Troy, Troy almost jumped off the chair back there. <laughs> how, many, how many of you watch politics and you get frustrated? Come on. Right? Listen to me. When you look, we have a frustration that's been thrust upon us sometimes in our lives that are no of our own. Our creation has been frustrated, not by its own doing, but by the sin of man. You know, humanity has never known the heavens and the earth without the impact of sin. Since Adam sinned, we've never known it without the impact of sin, the corruption of sin. We've never known the earth without evil. We've never known it without wickedness. We've never known it without the corruption of sin. You know, we live in a place now on an earth that's separated by the seas. I want to go to Europe, I got to fly over the ocean. How many people in here don't like flying over the ocean? I know there's some. Like, I ain't flying over the ocean, right? My wife will go anywhere in, in the States and she don't want to go over the ocean. The problem is, there's some really cool places over the ocean, right? But I got to go, I got to navigate the waters to get places. We're separated by the seas. We live in a place where cities are full of violence and wickedness. How many of the cities are actually beautiful in some ways? I love to go to New York City. I don't want to live there, but I love to go there. I love the sights. I love the uh, attractions. I love to do the city at night. I, one of the, I, I love to go to the top of the Empire State Building at night and look out over the city. One time we walked the Brooklyn Bridge, and that was amazing. And, and just, I love cities in so many ways, but yet I don't want to live in many of them. Why? Because let's face it, they are full of violence. They're full of wickedness. There's all kinds of stuff going on. I don't really have a burning desire to move to Chicago, I got to tell you. Right? When we look at what happened in our cities across the and this is not a political, I'm just, this is just talking, where there's these protests and when there's riots and there's all this stuff, I don't want to live in those places, right? We live in a place where God doesn't dwell among us. I mean, he dwells inside of us by his spirit, but I mean, he doesn't live among us, well, among us. We live in a place where tears fill our lives. How many of you have shed tears? Well, before I'm done preaching, you will. That, that you've had tears. We live in a place where we mourn. How many have you ever mourned? Right? Oh, some of those tears. Think about those tears. Where they come from? They come from mourning. Tears come from disappointment. How many have ever been disappointed? How many have ever been heartbroken? How many have ever shed tears from disillusionment? That tears of brokenness. Whatever it might be. We live in these tears and we mourn. We live in a place where we cry. We live in a place because we, there's pain. The tears, and the, there's pain. How many of you have experienced pain in this life? Well, not too many of you, huh? You, you have the pain of sin. You have the pain of death. You have the pain of your own. How many of you have the pain of your own actions? How many have the pain of your children's actions? There's pain that comes with it. There's pain that comes with sin. There's pain that comes with death. There's pain that comes with violence. There's pain that comes with all this stuff. When you, even, even whenever you are not even directly connected to something, but you see it on television, how many know there's pain in watching a place have, a, have an earthquake that kills a 1,000 people? At least there should be some measure of pain. There's pain in seeing some of the atrocities of this world. 
We live in a place where there's pain. We live in a place of crying. We live in a pain of tears and mourning and we're corrupted by sin. That's just where we live. This is, okay? But I got a good word for you. Ready? But. That's a big but. Don't go. Don't go there. <laughs> I need a drink. Heck. That could have got me in real big trouble. <laughs> Just take a drink. Shut up, Jim. <laughs> Don't egg me on. All right. But, this is the good, listen to me. But, this is the place we live. But, that place. Come on, how many know we live in this place with an eye on that place, knowing the promises of that place? Yeah. All right, listen. But, that place called the new heavens and the new earth helps me live in this place. Listen, every writer points to a future day. Every writer points to the promises of God. The promises of God are the promises of God. And how many know we should be excited about them one day? Okay, it doesn't negate God's goodness now. It doesn't negate the promises that we walk in now. But how many know there are promises on the horizon that we're never experiencing on this earth? That's a good news, man. Okay? But we live on this place, but that place called the new heavens and the new earth helps me live in this place. I live in this place with the promise of that place. Paul lived that way. Paul knew for him to live was for the benefit of his people, but for him to die was gain. Why? Because he was going to go to that place. Man, my mic is flipping all over the place, Troy. Troy, you have a mandate. If I don't have a mic by next Sunday, Kelly's going to beat you up. <laughs> what? <sighs> okay, there we go. Listen to me. Get this in your spirit this morning. And what I want you to get in your spirit in a moment, is I want you to understand something. Get rid of your notion that you're going to some ethereal place, living in the clouds one day. You're not. You're going to live on the earth one day. You're going to live on a new earth created by God, very similar to what we have, without evil, without wickedness, without sin. That's where you're going to live. Okay? Now listen to me, because this is important to understand. Right? Okay, but that place... When we, that moment happens, the new heavens and the new earth, it is the moment that the history of time ends. Right? And the beginning of eternity on earth. It's that, it's that dividing line. The moment that happens, the old, everything from that moment before us is gone. And so, but that place is a place with a new atmosphere, with a new heaven. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? I'm going to tell you something this morning. I think I'm pretty good. Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, which you only ever had to do, what, one other time? <laughs> Say amen, Peter. The Lord will bless your life. But I don't think we're going to have earthquakes or tornadoes or tsunamis or all the other things that destroy. Come on. Think about that. None of that stuff's going to exist. None of it. But that place is a place with a new earth. But that place, come on, is a place where the Bible says that there'll be no longer any seas. Wow. I kind of, I can't. Now listen to me. Some of you are going to come to me afterwards and you're going to ask me, But how this and how that? And I'm going to give you that great answer. I don't know. Okay? Somebody's going to come to me and say, but but pastor, what happens to the fish? I don't know. They're going to come to me. Someone will come to me and say, but pastor, if I had a baby that died at six, what age will they be at that? I don't know. (laughs) Can I just, are you okay with that? Well, if you ain't too bad. But I ain't making up an answer. I'm just telling you, I don't know. This is what I know. I know what the Bible promises, 
And how God does it, I don't know. But I'm pretty certain that the God who creates something out of nothing has it figured out. All right? I don't have to have that all figured out. I don't have to have it all figured out how a car engine works. I turn the key, it turns on, I move. I don't have to know how a computer works. Hit the button, click the keys. If it doesn't work, call Troy. And if he doesn't get there within 30 seconds, threaten him. I have no patience for computers. Shh. You look like Punxsutawney Tony Phil. Every once in a while you stick your head out when I say something you like. <laughs> Listen, Phil, just stay back there. <laughs> yeah, he comes out and sees a shadow. I'm going back in now. <laughs> I heard him. He said something I like. Listen, there's gonna, there's, the, the, think about this. The earth now is separated by the seas. I don't know how it works. I don't know what that all means. But what I do know is the Bible says there will be no more seas. Right? In Jewish concept... One of the things you have to understand in Jewish concept, the sea was a place of separation and evil. Okay? And so in the thought process there is there's not going to be any more separation and there's not going to be any more evil. In Revelation, in chapter 13, but in Revelation, the sea was the source of the beast and a place of the dead. How many know I don't want to live in that place? But that place is a place without the presence of evil. We live in a world of evil, where there's evil. You cannot live in this earth and say there's no evil. The heinous things that happen, the dark things that people do to people, that is perpetuated and it originates from wickedness and evil. And it breaks your heart. And you can't wrap your mind around it. When people abuse kids, when mass murder happens, when people will shoot up a school and shoot little school children, that's evil. That's wickedness. That's the place we live in. It happens. But that place is a place without the presence of evil. But that place, the Bible says, is a place that's prepared for his people. Hmm. Prepared for. Jesus said what? In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there and prepare a place for you, I will come so you may be where I am. But here's what John said. John said, then I saw the holy city. This thing's flying all over the place. <laughs> I see it before in front of my eyes. But that place. <laughs> I know what you really mean. He's holding up duct tape back there. He don't mean, he don't mean it for the mic. <laughs> Listen, but that place will have a holy city. Let me go back to the scripture. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. On this new new earth one day, there is going to be, there's going to be a city that comes down out of heaven. It's an amazing city. It's a brilliant city. It's an opulent city. It's a glass city. It's a cube city. That, That one dimension, if you took the one dimension of it, you would go from Maine to Florida. I mean, that's a big stinking city. It's two point some million square miles. For those you've heard me talk about before, if you build a skyscraper inside the New Jerusalem and you build it as high as the city, it would be 660,000 stories. And you think the Empire State Building is big. You know what I would love to do in that? I'd like to have an elevator in that 660,000 story. And I'd like to get on with Peter and Troy and I'd like to push every button. Be like Elf. (laughs) But that place will have a holy city whose origins are not of this earth. Men build cities in this world. 
Men build them on might. Men build them on ninja. Men build them from money. And stuff. The origins are of the earth. But how many know that he builds a city that's origins are not of this earth? The promise of God is a city whose architect and builder is God. How I many that's what Abraham was looking forward to? The ancients were looking forward to a city whose architect and builder is God. But that place will be a city where citizens live as covenant community of believers. Right now, you're in this church this morning. You're in this room this morning. And this is a covenant community of believers that we gather together under the banner of Jesus. Pretty much like-minded. But there's going to be a day where we're going to live on an earth with a community of believers. What a place that will be. What an amazing place that's going to be. Scripture says this, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. But that place is a place where God will dwell among his people. That promise, that promise is that moment that God will dwell with us. I want you to think about this for a moment. The heartbeat of God has always been to dwell among his people. The heart of God has always been to dwell among his people. How many know you, for the most part, your heart beats for your children? I did not get a rousing amen there at all. Okay, all right. You have a, well, ready, ready to cheer me on on that one. I love my kids. Oh, my kids, I love them, Pastor. Yeah, I can tell. Your heart beats for the moment they leave. When ISIS and Al Qaeda come to visit, right? The promise of God is that moment when we will live in the reality of His presence on the new earth. The promise will fulfill the desire of God to live among his people. Think about this. I've already said it. God has always desired to be among his people. In the garden, what did God do? The Bible says he walked with them in the garden. Why? Because he wanted to be there with them. He wanted to be among them. The tabernacle that he gave Moses, the tabernacle of Moses, what was it? It was a means for God to dwell among his people when they came out of Egypt. The temple was the same thing. It was a means of God to dwell among his people. How many know today that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that you are that, the place where his spirit dwells? He's always wanted to dwell among his people. Always. But how many know we have an unholy earth? Right? The moment the new heavens and the new earth become a reality, the desire of God's heart will be a fulfilled reality as he will dwell among his people. Yes, we understand the presence of God. I, don't know, I mean, we understand sensing his presence when his presence is among us. But how many know there's going to be a day we're not going to have to play a guessing game. We're going to know the reality of that presence. Last week when we were here, you know, we, 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 we try to follow the leading of the Lord. We try to follow. How many know it would be a whole lot easier if he was standing next to me saying, Jim, do this. But last week we... I'm up here and I'm just feeling that the Lord says, do an altar call now in the middle of worship. Okay. What do you do in that moment? You start arguing with God. Because you're like, okay, well, God, maybe it's me, maybe it's you. Is this you, God? Is this me, God? Da, 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 back and forth, blah, 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 blah. Finally, it's like, okay, whatever. What do I got to lose? We do an altar call. Four people get saved. One of which can't stay to the end of the service when we typically do the altar call. Come on, church. That's the presence of God. That's the leading of his Holy Spirit. But how many know there's going to be a day where he's going to be among us and it's not going to be a guessing game? His, the, 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 the desire of his heart will be a fulfilled reality when he dwells among his people. The God of the universe wants to dwell among us. Man. And that's what he'll do. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more, more death, 
sorrow, or crying. Hmm. Under this current earth, heaven and this current earth, tears are common. Tears are common. Some of you shed tears this morning. Some of you shed tears last night. Some of you are shedding tears right now. Wonder when's he going to end? Until I see Becker in tears, I ain't quitting. <laughs> but that place is a place without tears. Because that place is a place of God's comfort. I want you to think about this for a moment. How many of you have ever had a child, your child, shedding crocodile tears? I mean, I'm not talking about the fake ones. I'm talking about the real ones. Like, they're heartbroken. I mean, their pet salamander died or something, you know? <laughs> and they're crying. And they're sobbing. And you, in your moment of tenderness, look at them and say, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> no. What do you do? Don't you go and you take, they wear glasses, you take them off, and you wipe those tears away with your thumbs. Any of you been ever done that? And you're wiping those, it's going to be okay. And you're comforting them, and you're loving them, and you're just wiping those tears away. Do you get the image of what God's going to do? His tender, loving compassion. I can't keep up this mic. <laughs> Wiping the tears away and saying, I love you. It's going to be all right. No longer will you cry anymore. Yep. Come on, That's church. Right. That's very true. <laughs> Did you take my clicker, Mary? That's going to be a place of God's comfort. He comforts now. He binds up the broken heart. We know the Spirit of the Lord does, but there's going to be a day where he's literally going to wipe them away. But that place is a place without death. There's not going to be any death. Guess what? You're not going to lose a loved one in that place. You're not going to lose a child. You're not going to lose a mother. You're not going to lose a father. You're not going to lose a brother or a sister. You're not going to lose a friend. You're not going to lose anybody ever again. Death will have been abolished. Come on, church, this is how we live in this earth. We live in a place of death, knowing one day we're going to live in a place where there is no death. But that place is without mourning. Come on. Don't you love it when you go to a place of joy? Don't you just love that? How many of you love those joy suckers in your life? <laughs> hmm? Like... He said, good morning. What's good about it? <laughs> okay. It was not a descriptive statement. It was a greeting. <laughs> Can we, it was, I wasn't describing it. This is going to be a place where there's no mourning. No, a place without pain. Everybody in here, for the most part, has had pain from something. It's the pain of death, the pain of loss, the pain of separation. It's the pain of somebody betraying you, leaving you, turning their back on you. It can be a number of things, but everybody in here has experienced some pain in life. Under this current heaven and the current earth, pain's a constant. It's just part of it. But the new heaven and the new earth, pain-free. Pain-free. Hmm. You know what that does? We live on the current earth with pain. But our pain is tempered by the promise of a place that will be free of pain. That yes, I'm enduring pain. And yes, I have this pain. And yes, I'm going through this morning. And yes, I'm going through But it's tempered by the promise of God that there's going to be a time and a place where there's no pain. How many of that helps you endure? That hope helps you endure. You don't grieve as men without hope, Paul said. That while it's part of your life, it doesn't consume your life. 
Because here's what the scripture says. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The former things are gone. <laughs> See, here's how does how's that impact us? Because here's the deal. We live in this place looking towards the promise of that place. The disciples understood this. The apostles understood it. We live on this earth with the promise of that earth. When you think of the earth in which you live, and I want you to think of all the good things about it. I want you to think of all the, I don't want you to think of the bad. I want you to think of all the, you taking a picture of me? Why? <laughs> She's meant to take pictures of the slides, you moron. <laughs> I know you, and I'm, you're not a moron. I'm just having fun with you. He's taking pictures of everybody because she left her phone to go somewhere, and he's supposed to take pictures of the slides, so he's taking pictures of everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. i got to give you some of this. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'll get in trouble for what I do. I'm Don't worry gonna... about it. We're going to live in that place I'm... one day. <laughs> Don't worry, Becker. You won't have to worry about it in that place. <laughs> I can't help it. Excuse me. Listen to me. We're having some fun. But listen to me. The promise, God's promises are the very substance of our lives that give us hope in the midst of this world. And I'm not talking about an escape theology. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about the promises of God when he's going to bring this place and he's going to bring the earth back to what he originally designed, which was to be a place with no death, no mourning, no crying, no anything like that. It was to be a place of joy. It was to be a place of his presence, a place where we dwell together with him. That's where we're going to happen one day. Listen to me. So, so as you navigate this earth, do not lose heart by the trials and the tribulations and the pain of this place because you remember the promise of that place. How many know there is a that place on the horizon? And you say, well, pastor, I don't know how, I don't know, you know, how that affects my life. I'll tell you how. Come on, Troy. I mean, that's hope right there. <laughs> but listen to me. When you are certain, how many, how many this morning you're certain of, I'm, I hear about it the whole way around. I'm coming, <laughs> Ethel. Listen to me. You, you, we live in this world. How many of you are certain of your salvation? How many of you believe his promise for salvation? How many know the fact that you're saved changes how you live? But we need to have an understanding that this world is not as good as it gets. And we're not just passing from it to live in the clouds as a vapor on a cloud. And you ain't getting no wings, by the way. Just, just telling you. I'm be gentle. You got something far better than angels. You're the redeemed of the Lord, baby. You're going to judge angels. When you die, you know, we like to say these things, and I know we do it in a way of comfort, and there's nothing harsh about what I'm going to say. But we don't get angels. We don't get wings when we die. 
You get Jesus. Come on. Come on. You, you get Jesus. And when you die on this earth right now, you go to some place outside of this time and space dimension. How it exists, I don't know. But I'm absent in the body, present with the Lord. Awaiting that day where one day the new heavens and the new earth will become a reality where all the redeemed of the Lord are going to live. That's going to happen one day. And so as you navigate this place now, you do it with an eye and an ear towards that place. That you know I, that someday the pain of this world is going to be gone. That someday you're going to be reunited with believers. I believe you'll know them. But I've said this many times. The allure of heaven is not lost loved ones. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. When you'll see him face to face. But what a day it's going to be when we live in a place where there's none of this negative that this world has. You see, this earth that we live in has been corrupted by humanity, not God. But there's going to be a day that we live on earth that's not going to be contaminated by sin because there's not going to be any devil. He can be thrown into the abyss. He's going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. There'll be no temptation. What a day. What a day. And I want to build hope in you today. Allow it to give you joy. Some of you are suffering. Some of you have mourned. Some of you have lost loved ones recently. Some of you lost loved ones a long time ago. And how many know the memories never stop? But you don't want them to. Even if you're here today, I often say this to people who lost children or to upbuild. They don't, the, the, fear, the fear isn't you talking to them about those children. The fear is that you forget they lived. So I encourage you, talk to them about their deceased. Say, man, I remember so-and-so. And I remember when he did this and they did that. You know? But you're going to live in this world with the promise of another. I've gone all over the world. Sometimes with Peter. Caused me to want to get home quicker. No, nah, that's not really true. I went with Troy one time. We went to India. Wasn't that fun? We went to a lot of places. I don't really want to go back to India. I'll go back to Mayorka. I'll go back to Egypt. I'll go back to all these other places. India, eh, not so much that place. Matter of fact, when we were on that trip, I was like, I'm ready to go home. But you can endure that place because I'm not living in that place. I'm only living in that place temporary, and I'm coming back to this place. And how many know now, today, you and I endure this place because we know we're going to live in that place. You're passing through. This is not as good as it gets. This is not the end. Let me share my, let me, let me share my funeral story. And I'll quit. I, I use this at every, almost every funeral. So many of you have heard it. If you heard it, listen to it again. There was an elderly lady about to die. She knew her time on earth was at hand. She knew her time to leave this earth. And she called her pastor. And the pastor came to the house. And when he came to the house, she went through every detail of her funeral. This is what I want to wear in the casket. This is what songs I want sung. This is what I, scriptures I want you to use. And on and on she went, giving every minute detail. And he prayed with her and he got up to leave. And she said, oh, wait, come back. There's one more thing, and this is really important. So he sat down and she said, I want you to make sure that when I'm in the casket, I have a fork in my right hand. And he looked at her. And she says, that puzzles you, right? She said, yeah, it's kind of weird. She says, all my life I go to church dinners, church socials. We'd always eat the main course. And everybody would start cleaning up the mess. And then inevitably somebody would say, keep your fork. She said, and I knew when they said keep the fork, something else was yet to come. She said, I knew something like deep dish chocolate pie or I knew like apple pie or, or cake or something rich, something with substance. She said, what I knew was the best was yet to come. 
She says, so when you see me, when they see me in that casket, and they ask you, what's up with the fork? You tell them, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Come on, stay with me. Everybody say, but that place. You see, you can fill in the blanks before. In this place I have, but that place. In this place right now, this happened, but that place. You can fill in the words before it, but follow it up with, but that place. I'm not texting Troy, I'm looking up scripture, by the way. came an invitation there was a description of that place but then the scripture goes on and said he said to me it's done I'm the alpha I'm the omega I'm the beginning I'm the end to him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water life but how many know there really was a cost it wasn't your cost and you didn't pay it how many know Jesus paid it? He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he'll be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually impure, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and liars, their place will be the fiery lake of burn, burning sulfur. You see, you got to understand something. There is that place, and everybody in this room is invited to that place. Everybody. But there's only one way into that place. And his name is Jesus. There's only one way to that place one day. And that's by putting your faith and your trust into what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. The lamb that was slain, the blood that was shed, the body that was given that we celebrated this morning. That you would be saved now with a name written in the Lamb's book of life. To one day walk in, to be in that city, to eat at that supper. There's an invitation. The invitation is before you this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You can't live under the promise of that place if you live in this place without salvation. The promise of that place resonates within those who are in a state of salvation and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ now. the way to that place. When Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms, when he did that passage, he said, you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. So how do we know the way? And Jesus said, what? I am the way. I am the truth. And so I ask you this morning, there's an invitation before you. And that invitation is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, the one who paid for your sins. That invitation is to accept him that gets your names written in the Lamb's book of life. And that one day you will live on that new earth under the new heavens. Only made possible because of what Jesus did. Every head bowed, every eye closed. That's you today. You say, I want to accept that invitation. I want to accept that invitation. I want to be saved. Raise your hand nice and high. Somebody's going to come right to where you are and pray with you. Anybody at all? This is the day that you accept that invitation. Now wait a minute. Holy Spirit, move on hearts.
today you say, I'm going to put my faith in Christ. That I give my life to Him. I give my heart to Him. My name's written in the book. And I look forward to a city whose architect and builder is God. There is no other way to that city outside of Jesus. If you died today without Jesus, you'll never see that city. One last time. Anybody else? I'll count to three. One, two, three. I always say this. You may not have raised your hand in this service, but you don't need to raise your hand in this service. You can bow your heart. You can bow your knee. You can profess in your car, in your bedroom, This is just an opportunity to, for someone to do it with you. But you certainly can do it. Where you come to God through Jesus on your own. And I encourage you to do it. 